welcome uh, Vicki. Thanks so much. Uh, I know we're behind time. I think another session. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm also very cognizant that I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, and when I get excited about something, I tend to get a little bit ambitious uh, around the content. We were trying to get the slides uploaded so that you could actually have them in hand right now because there are some what I would call text-heavy slides, which is really irritating when you want to walk away with some points right away. So all I can say is we can promise that these will be in your hands. So if I can encourage you to experience this session, uh, as opposed to feel like you're going to be examined on it tomorrow from a content point of view. Um, so when, and Jim had asked me to come for this and uh, we were going to talk about something else and that because of these monthly long-term athlete development projects <coughs> that we do at Percy Page, Jim had said, okay, we were discussing parents in sport and uh, the, the conversation with the number of uh, PSOs, our, our provincial sport organizations, not just uh, volleyball, but the, would you not say, Jim, the, the conversation was, so that's what kind of led to, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe we could do this. So just for, for my benefit, um, in the room, if I could just get a sense of age groups that you coach, what would be the, let's say, the youngest age group? Oh, 13 to 12. U12 and U14, and then what would the oldest be? U18. And so safe to say that all of those athletes, those players, still reside or are managed by parents. Fair enough? Okay. And again, uh, oh, okay, because uh, let's just get into it. So again, quiz question. Why do you think kids play sport? Fine. Fun? Friends? So because their parents did? Yeah. Exercise. To be active, exercise? Competition. Competition? Make friends. Make friends? Okay. Uh, and so the, what we're starting to understand is that youth sport is in, albeit this is a biased group, your, your, your gyms are probably inundated with it, sport participation rates in Canada are continuing to climb, in particular with girls. And we talk about it almost like a set of lemmings by the age of 13, 14, the numbers start to drop. Decline, yeah, sorry. And my cold, and again, I apologize if in the back if I'm sounding like a, a, a whispering frog, but I'm, I'm not, I'll do my best. Um, so decline, yes. And one of the hot spots in there is that the focus in youth sport is way, way, way too much on winning and outcome at the expense of some of the very things that you have just mentioned. And this whole piece around fun, friends, is a lot about creating a sense of belonging. So I often say to coaches that if you find you're doing anything, in your training environment, in your performance environment, your competition environment, to negate this sense of belonging, I'd encourage you to have a look at it. Because that's going to be one of the reasons, particularly for kids 14 and under, do sport. The socialization requirements for youth sport is a highly, highly under-regarded, ignored factor. Because a lot of adults get involved and they think it's all about either them or winning a lead or winning the next match. And Jim, I'm probably going to leave without a lot of friends in this room because I know I'm dealing with coaches who for various reasons feel pressures, either from clubs, parents, whatever, to win. So aside from that, that's the culture that you're in. So we're still going to try and address an understanding about who we're trying to serve in youth sport, in your sport of volleyball. Dr. Camilla Knight, she completed her PhD a number of years ago at U of A, in faculty of phys ed and rec with Dr. Nick Holt. She did her master's degree in the UK all around developing positive parenting. And boy, I mean, tennis was her sport, and she was actually starting to work with the International Tennis Federation, because believe me, if, you know, we all think we deal with lunatic parents. 
Um, some of those professional oriented sports are definitely, definitely uh, filled with extremely overzealous parents. Um, and then the EPL, the English Premier League with football, caught wind of some of her work around promoting positive parenting. And hence, she has, she's really, I would consider, world leading in this area. So I've been, she's over in Swansea now, back home in her, in her home country. But I've continued to stay in touch with Camilla. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and she's partnering with us on some of our LTAD lunches to help us inform sports about promoting positive parenting. And you'll notice that it's not about parent education. We're starting to find that the word about parent education, the term education, parents get a little bit itchy when you think that you gotta educate them. So if, if we're starting to find that there's language that alienates them, because this session is all about trying to view parents with a different set of eyeballs and lenses. So this is kind of a, a, a I would say an opening warm-up humor piece that was offered by a coach some time ago. So when asked, a coach reported that their favorite place to coach would be at a youth detention center. Why? No recruitment, second of all, no away games, and second of all, no parents. So clearly each of these in the history of coaching and sport has carried its own what I call grief, misery, and aggravation. Not surprising probably to many of you is that this whole notion around whether or not we're dealing with uh, who's responsible. And, and I know I kind of grew up more in the 1960s era around if, if bad things happened at school, if, if I wasn't either academically performing well, it was the skin off my face that was going to be lost. Uh, nowadays, fast forward, and now it's usually then that the teacher has done something wrong. And I would certainly place coaches in that too, that if the youth player, the athlete, isn't advancing to the likings or expectations of parents, oftentimes then you might catch it. Okay? Um, we're in an era of the helicopter parent, the overstructured child, uh, kids nowadays, you know, with their 24-7 with their schedules, very little free time. Um, we're, we certainly are dealing with managed children. We often talk about parents because of their own very busy schedules. Perhaps have children with a sense that this is project management. It's somewhat akin to getting their house renovated, to planning the next holiday. They become planned items. Now this might sound kind of really dark, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that parents do not love their children very much, and they want the best for them. So in this crazy space that we're in right now, and I'll even put a, a bold cap lock on crazy based on what's going on south of the world right now, nothing, nothing can be surprising. But parents, and sometimes when they're in single parent homes, there is a lot of strife and stresses for them. Also, parents seem to want guarantees about simply because they enroll in something, there is a guarantee of outcome. Wow, wow. I mean, we know now in our education system <coughs> that many kids don't fail any grades prior to grade nine or 10. They're simply marched through the system regardless of what their academic capabilities are. And for the life of me, I do not know who that serves. Also, this idea of instant gratification. We want guarantees, and we want it now. So we become a pretty impatient culture. So I'm trying to paint, albeit again, I don't mean to be kind of completely dark on this Saturday afternoon, but it, it's reality, and as coaches, and I have coached, um, I was on two Olympic teams with rowing in my younger years. I've coached a variety of sports. Most recently, I was coaching a, a girls' soccer team here in the, in the city from about the ages of six, seven, eight, up until the age of 16. And, and I understand the transition of the culture that we're in right now. <coughs> so, for a minute, 
What I want you to do is at your table or have a little chin wag with someone next to you. I'm going to give you one minute right now. Have a quick chin wag. What do you think the role of parents are in the sport for their child? Off you go for a minute. <laughs>
we can just make more enemies as we go here. Anyway, and so that's something that was so strong with me is that I, as much as my son, who is uh, and daughter were, were uh, grew up here in Edmonton, they love the Oilers, so they weren't contaminated, so to speak, by my love of the Habs. Um, but that's where we pick it up in the way in which parents interpret the world. That's often what the child is there first learning. And we find that oftentimes what parents do is, is fourfold, if not more, impactful on the child's behaviors and actions themselves as opposed to what the parent says. What they do and how they act is much more powerful on the child. So this whole business is around how they interpret the, the world. So if you have a parent that has a beef with the ref, with a beef with the coach, the child, like osmosis, or is sucking it up like a sponge, so that the child's interpretation often mirrors that of the parent. And then one did say the role model. And that's often tightly connected to the interpretation. Because the parent who has a beef with the ref, who has a beef with the coach, the parent has a choice how they're going to act. The parent that acts with, with a lot of aggression, flying out with various hand finger signals or various verbals, the child too can start to think that that's an appropriate role on behavior for them to execute. So if we start to understand this then, if we start to understand that parent behavior, it's going to help us as we go through. Now, as I say, a lot of these, this is busy stuff, and I kind of want to get to more of the, the practical stuff that you might be able to take away and put into your own clubs right now. And Jim was saying, your seasons have just started. How many people have already had their season opening parent meeting? Okay. So, so, yeah. So, regard, and so by the end of today, if you think that there might be something worthwhile for you to create parent meeting part two, by all means, that, that's kind of what you'll be walking away with. So there's all of these different influences that the parent has on their child as a, as a young sporting player. So when you reflect, and again, this can be dual side. If you're a parent, do you recognize how much you are doing to help your child? And undermining or underlying all of this is for the parent starting to see a widespread value of the role that they serve for their child. On the other side as well, is it the coach recognizing how important parents are in sport? So it's coming at this from a value base of <coughs> we start understanding all the values that are underlying being a parent, being a coach, then we start leading to a much better place for everyone to work towards. Again, coming back, creating a sense of belonging for their child. Other than that, if we don't come at this from that values-based point of view, we're going to run to a lot of adjectives like you see in front of you here around what we might call parents. And again, you know, if we were given time, without again violating any kind of names or, or anonymity, it's sometimes a valuable experience to talk about some of the experiences we have with parents. Not just the ones that make us shudder and keep us awake at night, but also what are some of those parent experiences that you think, wow, you know what, that, that parent actually enriched this whole team. I can't believe the kinds of things that, that they did to help make this team a success. Or that they, how they portrayed themselves in front of all of the players, not just their own blood. So again, I think a balanced discussion is, is often worthy. Uh, other than, so the, the big take home message out of this is that parents are important and must be valued. But if we come in as coaches and automatically kind of go to that opening joke that parents, and you kind of go, that, that quiver or shudder that you think, 
if that's what you carry, then that speaks volumes around the, the nature of the value that you have for the parents of your athletes. And that's, again, what we're trying to flip here. Because if we can make strides towards that, then your life as a coach, and your entire program, and doing it as a club where you've got multiple teams, will change, and will change for the better. So optimal parent involvement, <coughs> excuse me, we can see it's about increasing chances for kids to achieve their sporting potential. And their sporting potential is not to be confused with this guarantee of where they're going to play, either positionally, what team, and so on and so on. It's about their sporting potential. And this sometimes runs them up because parents might have alternative ideas and expectations about what kind of skill set and eventual potential their child has. So again, this kind of illusion of grandeur that some parents might have on behalf of, of their child. Uh, helping children have positive psychosocial experiences in sport. That again, if I can boil that down to this idea of sense of belonging, especially, especially for that 14 and under age group, if you understand that the kids are coming to play sport to get that sense of social connection with each other, have fun, make friends, and if you do that well, if you nurture that kind of environment, then trust me, the win-loss record at the end of the season will not matter to them. But if it matters to you as the coach, and if you feel like you have sand in your shorts every time you lose a match, your players are going to smell that a mile away. And so you actually have to believe in it as well. And this is a tough piece for coaches, because I understand there's often influences and pressures, some very direct, some indirect pressures about winning being the end all and be all. This is a really tough, tough knot that we're experiencing right now, not just in volleyball, but in all youth sports. And volleyball, holy mackerel, I mean, it's blossoming here in Canada. Our men's performance in Rio was, it was just an absolute delight to watch, inspirational, and again, I mean, the way in which the, the coach speaks about the environment, again, I can understand, I imagine your own enrollment in volleyball would be right to say it's going up. Yeah, we had a bit of a spike with our 15 and 16 new age group this year already. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, I got I to gotta admit, I mean, living in Edmonton here, kind of through the country, we know that Edmonton is a bit of a cool mecca for volleyball, right? I mean, it's a good place here, and I know I credit a lot of the work that Terry Denlock and Maury Eisler has done in the city um, around creating this to be a vibrant place for youth volleyball. And then the last one here, <coughs> facilitating the development of a range of positive developmental outcomes. So again, not just the skill side of things, but there's a whole wide range of what happens to kids when they get involved in a quality sport environment, which is, I think most of us probably have all experienced ourselves. You as coaches right now, I'm sure one of the reasons you continue to, or that you are coaching, is, is predicated on, on past positive experience in, in sport and that you give back to your community. Um, this is again a really busy slide, but Camilla, when she presented this on her webinar, she said, here's one slide that kind of culminates my entire career. She's worked really, really hard to put a bit of a pathway in place for positive, uh, or promoting positive parenting. And the only one we're going to look at right here is where it starts. And this is again where I'm going to give you a few little key nuggets around how can, how can we start to engage parents to develop foundational step number one around shared and communicated goals. And that's, that's kind of where we're going to get. And then she talks about, uh, there's other parts around that. After the, once we get the shared communicated goals done well, then you go up to understanding their emotional climate and engaging in enhancing parenting practices for competitions. 
But for time today, we're just going to tuck in to this one here. Um, <coughs> there's two parts to this. You know, there's understanding the, the, the journey uh, and enhancing that individual journey. So does the parent understand their child? And how many in the room who are parents have more than one child? Yeah, and aside from if they're not twins, are, are they different from one another? <coughs> absolutely, absolutely. I've got a son and a daughter, and I, I can't believe how different the two of them are. And I kind of wonder sometimes, did you come from me? You know, I, I mean, they're just so different. Uh, the way in which they react to things. Uh, their, their likes and their dislikes. And so if you can imagine that that's happening from your own gene pool in your own home, you can only imagine what it's like based on the teams that you create. But do parents understand their own individual child's response? So how their child responds to a new environment. Sometimes a child is so enthusiastic about stepping out there and meeting new people, doing new things. Then you might have other children, same age from the same home, who were a little bit gun shy, a little bit wary. There are all these kinds of differences. So does the parent understand the individual within their child? And then, to what extent do they understand the child's journey? And it's the journey not only in growing up and maturing and developing, but what about their journey through school? You know, the ebb and flow, the roller coaster of the ups and downs. And same thing with their athletic journey. Do they understand that it's not this lovely, clean, uninterrupted, linear pathway to stardom? And oftentimes, the previous speaker, when they talked about Carol Dweck and the growth mindset piece, we often talk about, you know, the cliche of, you know, oh, the only way we learn is through failure. And I worry that we think failure is a, happens in isolation. <coughs> the whole piece around failure, and we train our athletes how to deal with failure. So we don't simply create the obstacle and watch them tumble over it. Our role as coach, and also as parent in there, is that when they fall and stumble, is that we guide them up and we help them learn what went wrong. And we equip them with options and choices around what can they try next. In absence of those <coughs> combined activities, failure done in a vacuum is, 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 is remiss. It's negligence. So I, I worry a little bit about this sort of um, elevated effort towards making our athletes fail. The, the failing is, is absolutely useless without the role of the support of the coach or in other circumstances with the parent. So that whole journey piece. So, raising awareness. Uh, and I'm going to actually go <coughs> straight to, um, Camilla has a series of little exercises that can be done with parents. And this again can be done if there are clubs that have, uh, want to really tackle this, these are kinds of things that can be implemented within clubs for parent support, you know, promoting positive parenting and so on. But I'm going to take you to another one, and Jim brought this up to my attention, and there was a bunch of us that had seen this recent blog. Now, yes, this is a girls basketball team, uh, they're senior high. And this, uh, this was a blog written by this guy, Nate Sanderson. Uh, the original article, um, this again will be in the link to the notes that you get. And uh, it's, it was posted on this Changing the Game project. And if there's, there's an awesome, awesome website. Is that where you got it from, Jim? Uh, yeah. yeah. So this guy, John O'Sullivan, he's out of the US. He's really taken it upon himself over the last years to look at what's going on in the <coughs> sport, and he's a dynamite speaker, talks a lot about uh, some of the issues that go on with youth sport. Anyway, this is where the blog is found. And this is a story about what Nate Sanderson did as coach of the Iowa State Champions Springfield girls basketball team. So again, this is a co in the context of 
girls' basketball, but what he's suggesting in these approaches is absolutely applicable to all age groups, probably down to about six or seven, all the way up until, I mean, adult, where, wherever parents might be involved. So I'm going to take you through this. So what he does, and the title of his blog was Coaches, Stop Dealing with Parents and Start Engaging. And so what he does is he's got this exercise, and there's three cards, these little uh, index cards. So what I'm going to walk you through here is what are the questions that he asks of the parents in this session? And I'm going to put, put the, the uh, piece right up front, is that he asks the parents to place their name on the card. And I'll tell you right now, what he's trying to do is establish not only a values-based approach within his program, but also uh, this piece of trust, is that many times we might be afraid to, uh, to say certain things either about ourselves or to be completely honest, but when we're in a trusting situation, we are more likely to tell the truth. So this is also his attempt to build trust. He's already done goal setting with his girls. And so this is, many of these questions are mirrored with the players on the team. So if you can imagine them on card one, card one on the front, write at least one reasonable, measurable goal you have for your daughter this season. Okay? And then on the back, write at least one reasonable, measurable goal you have for our team this season. And what's the purpose? It is to blazingly put out there to clarify expectations, both on behalf of what does the parent want for their child and what does the parent want for the team. And this is a team sport. Obviously, if it was an individual sport, we wouldn't be dealing with the team side of things. And it allows then that when it gets put out there publicly, anything that's completely outrageous um, to be addressed in a non-threatening way as soon as possible, when it gets written down. Most conflicts arise with players and parents due to unrealistic expectations. And wouldn't that be a thing of beauty if instead of expectations coming out and biting us in the ass partway through the season, that all of a sudden we have some clarity put out in front of us around what are those expectations. So this process then identifies those so that we can disarm them before the season even starts. Okay, kind of cool, that's where we get started. And then what he reminds everybody is that these goals, the, the usual goal setting piece, they gotta be measurable, performance related goals. So we know that it's really not possible to easily measure things like hard work, happiness, getting along with others, <coughs> and specific outcomes such as being a starter, uh, winning more games than we lose, qualifying for a state tournament, whatever, averaging a certain number of people, are concrete. Okay? Are concrete. And that's going to be super, uh, the, that exercise in and of itself gets parents really to start thinking, hmm, what is it I'm looking for? especially when governed by these concrete set of guidelines. <laughs> Card number two, and this is, a, a, again, a cool question for an entirely different reason. What do you want your daughter's experience to be like if she can't accomplish any of her goals that you wrote for her or for the team on the first card? And there's also a similar version for the player as well. So when they've gone through goal setting for the players, and they say, what do you want for yourself? What do you want for the team? What, what do you want if, if you can't get what you want? And I think that again, I mean, that just is so clever in and of itself. I think there's a lot of power in that. Uh, and what's the purpose? So again, what's going to make sport meaningful regardless of these outcomes? Because that's the whole point of goals, is that we have these measurable outcomes. And so then, what I've got on this slide and the next one as well are some of the sample responses. So some of the things that parents wrote in response to the question, 
Again, I won't read all of these out, but you can just sort of cast your eyes over that. As I say, text heavy, text heavy, but I, and when you get these notes, I wanted you to see what parents are able to write. And if they're put into that kind of context around, uh, you know, growing as a team, play as a team, to have fun. And remember, these are the responses that if they can't get the individual or team goals that they said they want, this is, this is what they still want, uh, create memories that last a lifetime, friendships. It's <coughs> hard to feel satisfaction that she knows she's done her best and confidence of being a great teammate and player. <coughs> Just such an effective exercise. So then before moving to card number three, show the parents what the players wrote in response to the same question. And then talk about a moment of rattle. You know, just where all of a sudden there is this, I, this opportunity to look at, when we talked about step number one, share and communicate goals. Because we know that sometimes we might expect the, the, the young athlete to have a conversation with their parent about those kinds of things. And sometimes they're not always brought out in the best situations. The, um, that, that classic, the ride home, which again, the troop sport has actually just made a, bit, a, a video about it, called exactly that, the ride home. Um, so again, if we can facilitate this as coaches, it demonstrates not only to your parents, but also to your players, is that you value the contributions of parents. And again, exposing some of these helps build the team. Card number three on the front. <coughs> what do you want your experience to be like as a sports parent? Go figure. Okay, what's the purpose? It validates the parent's experience. It also, few parents are comfortable sharing their answer to this question in front of others during the meeting. So what he has done with his, with his program is that he's compiled responses and sent them an email afterwards in this kind of anonymous way. Uh, again, sample responses. Uh, have fun watching the girls play, want to get to know other parents, growing together as a community of parents and so on. And then, this is a quote that he said, many of the parents want a similar experience as the players. Having fun, sense of belonging, be in a positive environment. And then the last part of this is, talk about inclusive, now you're going to turn around and ask them, okay, how are we all going to get what we want here? How are we going to be able to create the experience that you so eloquently described? And this is the uh, back half. What can you do to help create that experience for other parents? And this is also included in the email, along with what kind of experience. How are we going to make that happen? So again, look at these responses that parents come up with. Uh, make sure every parent is involved. Be excited and have more people join in. Trust that the kids are doing their best. Uh, be supportive, listen, have fun, and so on, you can read there. One other quote from that he comes out with at the end, he says, he's been doing this for a number of years now. Just as we encourage our players to find ways to create a positive and meaningful experience for your teammates, we encourage you to do the same for your fellow parents. If you can be faithful to the things written above, I have no doubt that your experience will be a special one together. I mean, talk about tackling some of the woes and grievances that we all face as coaches. And then the back half here, what can coaches do? So again, now, coaches, you're ponying up. And you're saying, okay, I've got stuff coming in from the athletes, I've got stuff coming in the parents. What can we do as coaches to help provide to make these happen? So again, it combines the need for parents to be accountable to one another with the importance of coaches being vulnerable to receiving feedback. And that again, 
I realize that might make you a little bit itchy. I understand that for sure. But this is a process of building that kind of trust within your sport community. And you can <coughs> and he talks about by opening yourself up to criticism in a constructive way, we're able to build trust, particularly as we follow through on some of their suggestions. And I'll let you to read the, the piece there, because there are some pieces that come out which I'll show you on this last slide, or second to last slide that I've got for you. Sample responses. So some of them here, look for individual needs from the girls. How many times do we sometimes coach or support those that are continuing to excel? Do we spend enough time on those that have some struggles? Uh, being positive role models. Um, this one here, coaches will always have their favorites, but they shouldn't show it. So again, sometimes that's a, that's a tough piece of feedback. But if coaches not only ask for that and then act on it, you are showing integrity to the entire squad. And that's what he was saying here. This is the very last uh, fly-in here. The feedback was encouraging and incredibly insightful. We choose to embrace those few comments that could be perceived as critical because they help us become better coaches. So, my world, I did get done. So I am, I, 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 like, I, I feel like everybody's, you know, you've just been in the wind tunnel and I've just gone <clears throat> at you. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I was so mindful. I know you've got this wonderful session. Now you can get off your tushies and, and go do some real stuff in the gym. But I was so excited to get this information into your hands because oftentimes at these sessions, what are the kinds of things you can actually walk away with and implement right away? And, and I do perceive that a lot of these things, you may not want to inundate them with, with everything all at once, but this becomes part of a, a validated approach to building parents into your circle. So I'm done, but I'm happy to address questions or comments uh, based on the stuff we've chatted about. Yes. The card idea is awesome example. Do you have any other ones of, of things you've seen teams do to get those those parents to communicate? And yeah. Uh, one exercise that Camilla has done this self awareness is that she has uh, uh, the the parents bring in a, a photo of their child when they're like one year old and under. And the process of saying, do you remember your child when, when she or he was this age? What kind of goals and aspirations and desires did you have for your child when they were here? It's very contextual, it's very grounded. There's that memory connection to the photo. And oftentimes, I mean, those of you that have been parents, when you think back, to when you have your, your first child, your second child, and so on, you know, what do you wish for them? And many times when the child is one and under, it's not about becoming an NHL player. Not then, anyway. And then you get a more current photograph of them more in a, in sort of within, within a year of the exercise that you're doing it. And you say, now what are your goals? And the parent, right there, it's a self-learning go, holy shit, what happened to me? <laughs> that kind of revelation. And Camilla says when that's done well, it's quite powerful. That's another example. But a, part of it is this idea that there's no, there's probably a lot of other ideas that will come up over time. This is quite new. But it's the idea of flipping that idea that, you know, deal with parents as opposed to, wow, if we start to value what they can do, can you imagine how can they, how they might be able to enhance your entire environment? No, it's not going to happen overnight, but it, it's, it's one of those diligent pieces as well. Any other questions or comments? Well, I thank you so much for your time, and like I say, I trust that you'll get the...